Podcast. Mike Staley Podcast. Episode 880. Hello, this is Mike Matthews broadcasting from Cafe Anyway here at the last place on earth, located somewhere in Pod Castro Valley. Today, the finale of my intimate interview with the wonderful Alan Clapp of the amazing indie rock band called The Orange Peels. We'll find out how he's even more talented than just being a singer, songwriter, keyboardist, guitarist, and so on. Mike's Daily Podcast. Plus, we'll hear from Adam Rutabaga, Valentino, and Bison Bentley. Don't call him a moron. Mike's Daily Podcast. Don't you just love those folks? That thanks to money, they can spout off their mouths on C-SPAN 3, or was it 2? Who cares? There was a guy I saw who works in technology who had this to say about our reality. Sales has to do with migrating down the torso away from the brain. Mike's Daily Podcast. He gets paid truckloads of money to teach a class. That's insane. Mike's. And then Daily. the number two podcast, podcast, if you look on iTunes, yeah. is a serial ripoff. Please. And at number three is Radio Lab, which is what you get when you take two three letter acronyms and come up with the most overproduced show on the radio. Yes, NPR plus ADD equals H E L L new. Look, we just walked in. Hello, my name is Jesus. This is Madame Blue. The big And who is that guy that you are talking about? That was on C-SPAN 3. It, it was like this bald guy with these glasses and a goatee. And he talked like this. Like this, like everything I'm saying right now is the truth. And Google doesn't know what they're doing. And Facebook is taking all of Google's YouTube subscribers because everybody's uploading their videos to Facebook. Google will be a myth in a couple of years. Their pants are falling off. Look who else just walked in. Oh, Mike, this is Floyd the Foreman. And this is John Deere, the engineer. Mike, I think I like that guy. I think he speaks the truth. Oh, well, maybe you would have enjoyed that C-SPAN 3 lecture or something. I think it was about books. Maybe it was C-SPAN 2. They're the book channel, right? I don't know. I love them all. I, like I've said before, I, I'm th- definitely hooked. But I don't have TV. But there is TV at work. So I will watch that instead of all the other mindless, you know what, that's on the TV. But that's just you, Mike. Everybody else likes the mindless pap. Mindless pap? Yikes. Yeah, that might be the thing. He was talking about with the migrating down the torso that, that our brains, people are not attracted to what's attracted to our brains. Which then makes me wonder how Radiolab is so popular. Because it is a smart show. It's way overproduced, but it's smart. So maybe maybe this guy is wrong. He didn't seem to... He was on a panel of other very smart people. And I think a lot of the other people were kind of like, Okay, dude, you need to let some air out of that ego. My God. Anyway, but John Deere, the engineer, you think you, uh, you, you saw that and you were impressed? Yes, Mike, though I am not a salesman, and I can't think like a salesman does. I can think in terms of technology, but not sales. Yeah, sales is a whole other world. It's weird, man. You got to really... It's, maybe, it, maybe it is all sales. Maybe it is all just non-brain stuff. It's all below-the-belt stuff. Because it's all like just whatever... It, it, it's all about the impulse buy, right? If your brain becomes involved and you think too long about purchasing something, then oftentimes you don't want to purchase it then. You'll shop around for something that costs less. So the guy that was trying to make money off of you by charging you too much, he loses out. Yay, that's a good thing. Michael Masu, another good thing is C-Span 3. Ooh. You you had to go back to that. Yes, Michael Masu. I'm watching it right now. There's some guy... In front of an audience of maybe two people, but there's 800 seats. I love watching this. It's very informative. So what do you think about C-SPAN 3 and guys like the guy that I saw that thought he knows everything and he gets paid? I think he said every time he teaches a class, he gets like over $50,000. It's crazy. 
and his, pa- his classes are packed, which may be why he gets that money. And what do you think about the podcasts that are, that are at the top of the list? Of course, number one is always This American Life, which is a slud down, a little bit calmer version of Radio Lab. And then the other two that were up there, Serial and this other show, are all just sort of these, what This American Life does in their, his uh, individual segments that Ira Glass does. His different acts. Today, act three. What happens when you buy a Volkswagen that's driven by a penguin? Oh, Mike, I really liked that episode. Yeah, that was a good episode. Okay, so what do you think? Email me, mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. We read your comments on the section emails from email. Also email me there if you'd like to be a guest on the show or if you'd like to sponsor the show. And you can also comment on the show through the Facebook page, facebook.com slash mikesdailypodcast. Also, there is the Twitter at Mike Talks is where you can follow me and you can comment there. We read your comments on the section emails from email and your common not so comments. There is also the f- website, Mike's Daily Podcast.com, where you can find where you can listen to the show in iTunes. Subscribe to us there. You can comment on the show, rate the show there. If you do, more people find out about us and we don't languish in obscurity. Maybe someday we'll even get into the top 100. Of the podcast on iTunes <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Laughing uncontrollably You can also find us on YouTube, SoundCloud, TuneIn Stitcher, Podomatic, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Player FM And Ameristream Live And listen to my weekday morning show The Mike Matthews Morning Show It's on a Connecticut radio station You can listen to it on the web On TuneIn actually And the link to that is at mikesdailypodcast.com. Also the link to where to listen to my weekend country music show that I do on Country Crossroads. And tell uh, tell your friends about this show through Instagram, Yelp, and Tumblr. Links to all of those at mikesdailypodcast.com, where to find us on all of those. And you can also check out the blog, The Daily Podcast Picture, all my past interviews at mikesdailypodcast.com. And if you want to help out the show... A great way to do that is through the link we have to Amazon. If you're going to buy anything on Amazon, go through that link at mikesdailypodcast.com and we get a little bit of support from that. But now, the finale of my interview with the Orange Peels. Into an interview. Okay, cool. I'm speaking with Alan Clapp. He is the groundbreaking, the ground, the, the, he's the ground beneath the Orange Peels. (laughs) He is the guitarist. I'll take that. I'll take it. Keyboardist, vocalist, writes the songs. He's the man. And it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to him. Your album covers are so beautifully designed. Oh, thank you. They're so, like, just professional. And does some graphic artist do them? They're amazing. Uh, well, actually, I, I do them. I, I've designed all our, our record covers since day one. Get out of so, here. No, that's me. It's me. Tell me about this uh, album cover for the Begin the Begone. It's interesting. Okay, so I was talking earlier about how we had gone through this life-changing experience and ended up moving uh, out of Silicon Valley up into the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so I thought it would be cool to, to try to come up with a, an image for the cover that would evoke this story somehow oh. and it's you know you're so already it's difficult because you have to try to tell the story of two different places and the transition and some some change going on and you're you're trying to give the the person looking at this album cover the feeling that that's all going on or that something's going on and so i started playing around with these photos of um the big redwoods and Douglas firs around our new house. And so I got, I got these photos of these treetops going and uh, started just kind of creating this landscape with these trees. And, and that was about as far as I got. And I thought, well, you know, this is the beginning of something. And so I, I sort of sent it around to the other people in the band. And uh, Gabriel, our drummer and co-producer, he he saw that, and then he popped he popped up this photo over the top of it. Mm. There was a photo that had been taken of, of me and Jill 
in our Eichler in Silicon Valley ah. um, back around the time that, that So Far came out. And when So Far came out in 2001, we, we had been, we got featured in uh, Architectural Record, uh, USA Today, San Francisco Guardian. All these people were writing about us uh, because the kind of house that we had, uh, the Eichler, was just like, it was, they were coming back into fashion. They were really hot at the time. And we recorded our record in our Eichler. And so, anyway, USA Today had done a story on us. And there was this photo that I had posted on Facebook a while back. And it was basically, we never really got the digital photo from the photo shoot that they took. So I had to scan, <laughs> I scanned the newspaper that that story ran in. And so it's a halftone print that actually appeared in the newspaper that I scanned. I posted on Facebook. Gabe, like, somehow, like, went through the old Facebook post. He fished that photo up, and he dropped it in in Photoshop on top of this tree landscape that I've been working on. And there's something about, like, the texture of the halftone, those dots, you know, it gives it this sort of, like, I don't know. There's... Like There's a, a texture there that is that looks like an overlay, like a new life being slapped on top of another life or oh, something. Oh yeah. And and yet, so you can see this new, this, you can see this backdrop of these trees, which is where we now live, and you can also see the structure of the Eichler and these globe lamps hanging inside, and me and Jill sitting there in front of the house, and it's like these, it's like these two different lives going on. One one in the mountains, one in Silicon Valley, and. So we tweaked that design, I don't know, for a couple weeks, and and then that it, it became our album cover. And I really like it. I mean, I, I think it does a good job of, of trying to tell those two, that that one story of these these two places. And Eichlers are these homes that are here in the Bay Area. There's a bunch not too far away from me here in Podcastro Valley. It was a, a guy whose last name was Eichler, and he designed these houses a specific way, and... He believed in, uh, like, uh, making it open to all races, not just having a bunch of white people live in them. He wanted, like, everybody to move into them. He, he wanted to, because there, there was still some segregation going on in the Bay Area. And anyway. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was very forward-thinking uh, for the, you know, the, he was building these from the late 50s all the way through the mid-70s. And so, yeah, he... He did not want any segregation. He he wanted integrated communities, and and he he's a guy that was thinking about designing communities not just to look a certain way, but to feel a certain way culturally and um, like artistically. He was just, I mean it was it was crazy to 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 think that something like that could work, um, especially given the political climate of like the late fifties, but. But he did it, and he took a big risk, and it, it totally worked. And, and you liked living in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Eichlers are great. Um, as, as open as Eichlers are to, or were at the time anyway, to, to uh, different racial groups and ethnic backgrounds, they're that open in their structure as well. Like, mm. you got these, they're built on posts and beams, and so you basically have not very many load-bearing walls inside. So you can, you can structure these things any way you want. And so the result is you've got like these open, contiguous spaces in an Eichler, whereas a traditional house have like a, little, a lot of little boxy rooms. Uh-huh. Eichlers are really open and flowing, and they had a lot of floor-to-ceiling glass between the inside and the outside. So it's like... Huh. Very Mad Men esque. I mean, if you would look at, <laughs> like, Don Draper would probably end up living in an Eichler in 1972, but it's hard to tell. Yeah. Well, we we'll never know because the show ended. We'll never know. We'll never know. He he. Uh, well, don't tell me what happened at the end. I haven't seen it yet. But anyway, uh, yeah. So enjoy your scotch in an Eichler. But now. <laughs> Now you're in a different. Aren't you in another interesting house, like a dome or something? It's not a. It's not a dome. It's a hexagon. It's uh, uh 
Yeah, it was just it was this crazy house that some guy built up here in the mountains in the late seventies. And it's six sides. It's a hexagon. The, the the first three pieces of the hexagon are like the open living area, kitchen, uh, living room, dining room, family room area. And then the other three sides of the hexagon are bedrooms. And so it's like, it's this weird modular kind of modern, uh, late seventies modern sort of thing. And it's really like he, the guy knew what he was doing. He, it, it's, it's sitting up on these, on this huge steel frame and these big I-beam girders going, going down into the ground. So it's sort of, it's perched up in the trees and um, it's just a one of a kind sort of a place. I, I've never really seen anything else like it. Where do you record it our, inside of it? What, we what record room? in the in the lower floor of that. There's there's a uh, a studio apartment downstairs. It's got its own bath and kitchen, and uh, we've turned that into our new recording studio. And so the recording process is you're like, hey, let's do an album, and people come over. Uh, it's it sounds like a party. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> And, and it's, it's, it's different, too, because, um, you know, we've got to be pretty intentional about setting up these dates because, you know, you, it, it takes a while. It, it takes over an hour to get up here from, like, the city uh, or from Berkeley. So, you know, we'll just block out a weekend and say, hey, come on, come on up for the weekend. And everyone stays here. And, um, you know, we just we hang out during the day making music until all hours and we keep it going as long as we can. Wow, that's Does that's it, pretty much the plan. <laughs> but uh, an album takes more than a weekend to make, doesn't? Yeah, it? yeah, 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 yeah. An album takes more than a weekend. We we started this record out actually in the old house right after the oh. accident. Uh, before we moved, right after Jill and I kind of started feeling like human beings again. You know, we weren't sore anymore, and we kind of felt like, hey, we want to do something uh, new again. And so we invited the band over for like, I think we were there for five days in the Eichler. And we recorded 90% of this new record in that five day period. And then we moved and uh, we finished the record up here. Okay. We wrote and recorded, I think, one song from scratch up here. But we did all the overdubs and all the rest of the production and mixing up here. Do you put uh, big Indian rugs on the floor? No, not yet. <laughs> uh, although that's, that, that could certainly happen. I've, <laughs> I've got nothing against that. <laughs> it seems like requisite <laughs> if you're going to record an album to have the Indian rugs. <laughs> you should have some of these things around. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's next. Tell me about the song. We're going to play Embers from Begon, Begin the Begone. Yeah, well, so Embers is... Um, Embers is one of those songs that we came up with in that five-day session at the old house. And it's, it, it just, I, didn't, I don't know where it came from. We were just all playing, uh, sharing ideas and stuff, and this thing just popped out of nowhere. And it was really pretty exciting to me because it, you know, whereas some of the stuff on the record is really atmospheric and kind of moody and uh, has this other kind of element to it, Embers kind of seemed like a radio hit from the 70s, like right off the bat. And, and it was just really exciting. Like, wow, we just came up with that thing. And uh, so, so we, you know, we rehearsed it for a few minutes, came up with a structure, recorded the track, drums, bass, piano and guitar, just right there. And then we used all that for the final take. But I had to, you know, that was the trickiest one to come up with words for because it kind of felt like an AM radio hit from the 70s. And I'm like, well, you know, what's this song about? I have no idea. And here's this great music. And, and so I, I really wanted to be up to the challenge. And um, around that time, I guess it was last summer when I was writing these words, I had, I had a number of friends that were going through breakups. And it seems like I was on the phone <laughs> this one week with three different friends who were just like, you know, telling me all this stuff that was going on with them and how awful they were feeling. And, and I was just like listening and trying to, trying to be a good friend, you know, and 
and hear all this stuff. And, and at the end of that week, I was like, oh my gosh, I should, this, should, this is a breakup song. That's what it is. Ah. It's a song about, about a breakup and, and the kind of thing that, that you, end up, you end up being stuck with at, at the end of a few years with this person or something. And so, you know, there's this idea of embers and like something that used to be like a fire is now just these glowing little embers. They're, they're fading out. 